Good afternoon, everybody. This, the, today's class is not going to be in the Parsha. I was asked specifically to um, zone you in to the three weeks that are coming upon us. So I want to talk about a subject, not only is it about the three weeks, but it's something that we do theoretically every single day. And it is hugely practical and down to earth, something I don't normally do. My story begins approximately 30 years ago when young men and women from the former Soviet Union were coming in great numbers to Jerusalem. And it's a great story, Rabbi Lef. Rabbi Lef, come in, come in here the story. Okay, it's a great story. I heard this from Rabbi Lef. That's what made me say the Freudian slip. Rabbi Lef told me the story. And it's about one of those, right near the Mir Yeshiva, there's a lot of these um, uh, workshops where you can make like woodwork and metalwork and all kinds of things like that. So there was two young boys from the former Soviet Union. By the way, where's Naomi? Naomi's from Odessa. She just joined us. Welcome. So I cannot do good Russian accent, but uh, I'll try my best for you. <laughs> what happened was is that these two young men got a job working for, working for a Hasidic Jew in this woodwork office, whatever it is. They were making all kinds of things from wood, a wood shop, and it's their first day at work. And it comes lunchtime, and everyone has a lunch break, and they sit down to have their sandwiches. So everyone takes out their sandwiches, and they have their lunch. And when the lunch is over, so the two young men watch the Hasidic Jew take out a little booklet from his pocket, and he starts going, and he's starting to bench. And they've never seen benching in their lives. And he's doing this for approximately three or four minutes, and they are in total awe. What is going on? And when he's finally over, they turn to him and say, what did you just do? Why are you saying prayers just after a meal? So he looked at them and he said, it's benching. You never heard of benching? He said, I, I, I says, he says, what did you just do? You just finished your, your meal and you're saying all these prayers? He says, let me explain to you. I actually said four prayers. The first prayer is called Birka Sazan, and it thanks Hashem for the fact that we have food, and it was written by Moses, our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu. Then there's a second blessing, and that second blessing is from Joshua, and we thank God for the land and everything that we have, and Eretz Yisrael and the Holy Land. The third one was written by King David and King Solomon. And they talk about the holiness of Jerusalem, and they talk about the rebuilding of the temple. And finally, there's a fourth bracha, which is a little complicated, but it talks about the fall of Beitar and what happened 2,000 years ago, and the miracles that happened. And finally, 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 there's a bunch of added thank yous that we have at the end, and that's what we call benching. So they look at this guy as if he's, as if he's completely and totally crazy. And they say, are you telling me you did all of that just for a tuna sandwich? <laughs> so that's the story. But when you think about it, this is a problem that secretly most people in this room have. I call it benchophobia, which means what on earth is going on? That all you do is you eat, did anyone over here have like the Neve lunches? Do you actually eat those little bits of pita? Or do you, who avoided the pita because they didn't want a bench? There we go. Okay, you admit it. So this is a problem. We all suffer from benchophobia, and that's the subject I want to talk about. But what I want to do is I want to go a little bit deeper into benching. I want to focus specifically on the fourth blessing, and then a little bit try and tie it into our own lives. So let's start at the beginning over here. For those of you who have never really studied benching, you need to do so. It is important for all of you to spend some time and ask yourself, if I am going to bench every single time that I eat bread for the rest of my life, I need to understand a little bit what's going on. I need to understand the structure. I need to understand the way it's done, what it's all about. And I just gave you a little a brief overview. And I told you the following thing. The Talmud in Tractate Brachot, page 48, discusses the nature of ben benching and its origin. And it tells us that benching was written in stages. It was written step by step, little by little, bit by bit. It began with a bracha that was written by Moshe Rabbeinu, our holy teacher Moses, in the wilderness. What did they used to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? 
the man, the manna. And he came along and he said, the food goes in and it sustains us and it keeps us going and it tastes delicious. And this is something that we have to identify, that man is a machine that needs fuel. And Hashem, with his love and his kindness, provides us with that fuel. And then we say all those beautiful words. I don't know if you have actually studied benching, but for example, we thank Hashem that food is bechein, food is bechesed, and food is berachamim. Exhibit A. Notice that this is aesthetically beautiful. It actually, look at the colors, the, the, the reds and the yellows and the, you know, this, we're having a, like a Van Gogh moment over here. Don't you, doesn't someone have like the urge to paint this? Starry, starry night. There we go. Paint your palette. Purple and reds and a little bit of oranges. And I would like to add that it has a very beautiful texture. So Kush Baruch Hu doesn't just give us vitamin pills. We don't just take things. He gives us things that's called Bechain. It's actually beautiful to look at. It's a pleasure. Next time you look at your fruits, even vegetables which I, representing the male gender, have a problem with vegetables in general. I don't know what it is about vegetables, but my wife is a salad person. And I am like a meat and potatoes, well, I guess potatoes technically speaking a vegetable, but uh, whatever it is, I, I, I just have a personal problem, me and many, many people, be warned when you get married, that that other gender does have problems with vegetables. As I always tell my wife, I tell my wife, I say, look, when you go to the world to come, so you get what's called the mystical ox. The Talmud describes the mystical ox, the shor habar. And then you have the mystical fish, the leviathan. So whatever, if you're into sushi, so you're going to have like sushi leviathan. And then there is the mystical wine, the yain hamashuma. And then there's the mystical fruits. There's every single kind of mystical thing waiting for us in the delights in the world to come, but there's no mystical veggies. Oh no, okay, that will remain rabbit food forever and ever. This is my own little personal agenda, but the bottom line is that you can paint vegetables as well. They're beautiful. Hashem makes everything with its own aroma, its own prettiness, its own texture that you can enjoy. That's called bechain. What does bechesed mean? Bechesed means one of the means of Bechesed means is that you look around over here, everyone looks a little bit different. Well, guess what? You look different because you are different, and every single one of you has your own unique and special tastes in food. How do we say in Ivrit? Betam v'reach? Anyone know? En lehit Okay, when it comes to taste and smell, what you like, you can't argue with people because everyone has their own tastes. People like strange things. People... <laughs> People, it's all kinds of things that people will eat. And you know what? People also have different cuisines. The bottom line is, is that Hashem gives things to us bechein, bechesed, meaning everyone gets what they like and the way they like it. And then barachamim. The word barachamim simply means you don't have to be a good person to be fed. Hashem says, I don't care who you are, what your background, I don't care what you've been doing with your day. I'll take care of you. If you want, I'll take care of you. So all of this is in the first brach of benching. The first brach is a celebration of the nature of food, the fact that Kosh Baruch has sustained us. Yes, ma'am. Okay, with that, you just switch subjects. So there is a concept called Tzadik Viralo, that bad things happen to good people, and we have to understand how Kosh Baruch Hu runs his world and what's going on over here. I'm talking about people here in this room. You're benching, and you're acknowledging that you can enjoy food. It doesn't happen that when you're, you're being good, then the food is good. And when you're being bad, the food is bad. Shim doesn't work that way. Food is an equal opportunity pleasure. Everyone enjoys it their own way. You're right. There's a question you can ask out there, how a Kodesh Baruch Hu runs his world. How can he uh, accept the concept of hunger in his universe? So that's a different discussion that's not for today. Today we're celebrating the first bracha of benching is celebrating the essential fact that Kodesh Baruch Hu gives us everything that we need. Those of you that thought that the person that invented benching was Mick Jagger, um, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you just might find if you get what you need. Well, guess what? OK, Moshe Rabbeinu got there first. Because Baruch Hu takes care of you. Whatever you need, you get. Except for when there's exceptions, which is a different discussion. The second bracha. We entered into the land of Israel, and we conquered the land. And suddenly, we realize that life is not just living in the wilderness. 
Life is not just waking up in the morning and hearing beautiful Torah classes. Life is not Nave. Sorry to disappoint you. You step out at one point and you build a home. And the idea of having a home is something huge. Ask Bilbo Baggins. There we go. He understood that. The dwarves need a home. He gave up his life practically for that. People need a home. Why do you need a home? Because you want your life to stand for something. You want to be able to build something that is meaningful. You don't just want to live. You want to flourish. You want to do something meaningful. Well, for Kla Yisrael, that flourishing equals the land of Israel. This is our base for making the world into a better place. This land is not just physical land. It's physical land that is steeped in spirituality. And Yeshua came along, and he celebrated it in the second, second bracha of benching. Yes, ma'am. Um, why in the second and third are we like giving these things unrelated to food? Like in our prayers daily, like we talk about things we're thankful for. And for God, why are we adding this to the end? So what I'm trying to show you over here is that the benching unfolds naturally, organically, from your meal. So the first thing is you do, you're eating. So when you eat, you say, thank you, Kodesh Baruch Hu, for food. But then you think to yourself, what do you need food for? What's food all about? So, so what? So you're just like a machine? You just put gasoline into your own car? It says, no, because you're alive. Why are you alive? So you can do something with your life. So, so this, in other words, Yeshua took what, our, what Moshe Rabbeinu did and said, OK, now let's bring it into the practical world. So you remind yourself at every single meal that you don't just eat just for the culinary pleasure. You eat because from here, we can go out and do things. But then King David and King Solomon said is that you have to focus on the ultimate purpose. So to quote a country song, life is a highway. <laughs> and where does it end? Where does everything go to? How, how does the story end? And the answer is, is that David and Malach bought a beautiful plot of land in a place that today we call Yerushalayim, where you presently are as I speak. And then his son, King Solomon, who had no blood on his hands, he built something of total purity, called the Beit HaMikdash, the Beit HaMikdash, which was a place where heaven and earth literally meet. This is where it all happened. This is the centerpiece of everything that Kishbar created in his world. And in the deeper sense, it is life's goal. All roads lead to Jerusalem. All roads ultimately lead to the Holy of Holies and that place where physicality and spirituality meet. The goal of everything is to create a physical world and total and complete harmony with the spiritual world, which already exists in this place called Yerushalayim and this place called the Beis Hamikdash, which we're all waiting for. Comprende? Mm -hmm. Senoritas, you're with me? Everyone's with me? Uh, alles gut? No, I can't do the Russian anymore. I'm sorry. Um, so that's the second bracha. The second bracha. I just wanted to make a, a personal little comment about the second bracha. The second bracha has the word al seven times. We thank Gosh Baruch Hu. The word al appears again and again and again. We say, uh, um, al shin va'al eres, va'al this, va'al that, all the different things. There's seven al's. I just get uh, Eretz Yisrael, Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, Bris Mila, Torah, Chukim, Chaim, V'chein, V'chesed, and then Achilles Mazum. I just wanted to make my own little point. There is an eighth one, but the eighth one we only say, on Hanukkah, which is Al Hanissim, say it on Purim as well. But I thought it's interesting that I noticed that it's the eighth Al comes out on Hanukkah. But the idea is we thank Hashem for this and for that and for that and for that. And we realize the riboy, the huge quantities of things in our lives that we can thank Hashem for. And then comes the third bracha. The third bracha is called Birkas Baini Yerushalayim from David and Shlomo. And I have a quote that I'd like to quote for you. The Talmud. In Saita, Memches Amud Aleph brings down, and I quote, Miyayim Shecharav Beis HaMikdash, Natal Tam HaPeros, which means that when the Beis HaMikdash died, a lot of things died with it. So um, some of you may have heard of a song called American Pie, and remember the phrase, the day the music died. Well, actually, once again, we got there first. The Talmud says that what happened when the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. We lost the audio pleasure of music, which means the complexity and beauty of music and the harmonies that existed once dropped to 
such a low level that is completely irrecognizable when you compare. I, I have no idea what I'm saying. I, I, I appreciate a little bit about music that, um, yeah, um, every generation, the music becomes less sophisticated. I, I did not mean to give you like dad attitude to the music that you listen. I know I mean, you're, if you're happy to listen to, to, to Zane or whatever you guys do, so that, it, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, whatever it is, whatever it is. But, um, but, I, but you, you will all admit to me in terms of sophistication and harmonies, so classical music is on a different level. Am I in trouble? Did I insult anyone? No, okay, whatever it is, but apparently, um, I don't really understand how this works, but it is possible, as you all know, the beauty of music is found in harmony. So there are sophisticated harmonies that go back generations where you can sing 10 different songs at the same time, like Scarborough Fair, right? 10 different songs, and they all blend in with each other perfectly. Now, if you follow that through 2,000 years ago, so at the time of the Chorban, music dropped significantly. And the ability to appreciate the audio experience, we completely lost. In the same way that Talmud said, we lost the sense of smell and the sense of taste, which means that the fruits that we eat now are delicious, but we have no idea what we could be enjoying. We, we are completely clueless what could theoretically be out there. I remember when I, I once went to um, Sao Paulo, anyone from South America, so I saw fruits, I did not know what they were, like this huge, delicious fruit, and they told me it's a pear. I said, I, I know what pears look like. I come from, I come from England. I've seen it, but this is not a pear. Said, it's a pear. It's just a Brazilian pear. So there's all kinds of exotic foods out there. So when we lost the temple, so we actually lost what it really is. When Mashiach comes, one of the things going to happen is that when we go to a supermarket, we'll be finding fruits and vegetables with tastes that we did not know existed. A whole new level of the experience of enjoying these things will be given to us. So that is, by the way, one of you asked, what does it have to do with food? So everything comes out from recognizing this from a meal, what we've lost and what we can appreciate that we have now. Fourthly and finally, and this I want to talk about a little bit more, is the fourth blessing. The fourth blessing is called Hatov Vahamative. Hatov Vahamative needs a little bit of a deeper understanding, and this is where this class is going to seg into the three weeks. We're going to talk more about the three weeks now. The words hatov vametiv, let me quote you from the Talmud, biyavne tiknu keneged harugei beitar. Oisayayim shenitnu harugei beitar lekvura, tiknu hatov vametiv. Hatov shuloi hisrichu, vametiv shenitnu lekvura. So we're going to have to learn this a little bit deeply over here because at first glance, it's just a little historical footnote. And somehow or rather, the rabbi said, no, this is not a historical footnote. This is so important. We're going to make everyone make a blessing every day. Now, I say every day because the Talmud just assumes that people eat bread every day. We all know that today we do not eat bread every day. Uh, my rabbi, um, tongue in cheek, he makes fun of our generation and says, how do we know that our generation is going down and down and down? Because we used to eat human food, and now we eat animal food. How do we know that we eat animal food? You come to us for Shabbat, which you're all welcome, Shabbos lunch. My wife makes gourmet spelt challah. She does. I'm telling you, it's delicious. I'm embarrassed to admit it to you. But if you came this morning and saw what I had for breakfast, then you'd be really shocked. I ate oatmeal. Now, tell me something. Isn't that pathetic? When you know an adult male eats oatmeal, oatmeal is for horses. It is an animal food. Our grandparents did not eat oat and spelt. They ate wheat. And they didn't eat healthy wheat. Today, we take out the healthy part of the wheat, and we just uh, we have what's called um, whole wheat, which is much, much healthier. My wife insists that I eat whole wheat bread. But our grandparents did not eat whole wheat. They ate just their wheat, and they were happy. So apparently, you know, we are now getting closer and closer to eating. What? Of course, they all died young, but let's not talk about that. Yeah, so you're right. There's a little technical problem over there. Um, but, um, but the point is, is that, I don't know, the way my rabbi was saying is that a little bit that people used to, used to descriptions of the feasts that they used to have was human food. 
and the centerpiece was always began with bread. Bread and then meat and wine. And these were like the foods that people you see when they used to celebrate. Yes, ma'am, what are you going to say? I'm just a little bothered by your analogy because saying that we shouldn't eat something because animals also eat it is like saying we shouldn't drink water because animals also drink water. I hear what and you're saying. Where like water is an animal thing and so it's not good for human consumption. I don't know. I like the rest of your analogies, but that one I just don't understand. I, I, I hear what you're saying. But let me give you an example. Okay, this is a, just basically a quote from the Talmud. Um, Passover, straight after Seder night, we bring a carbon which is called the Omer, which is made out of barley. And seven weeks later, after having counted 49 days, and we enter into the 50th zone, we eat the Shtei Alechem, which is a wheat-based sacrifice. So the Talmud says, we go from the world of barley to the world of wheat, which is another way of saying that what we try and do as human beings is we conquer our inner animal. So I'm not dissing the animal world. Okay, I love animals. I think they're great over here. But the difference between animal and human being is that only humans were created in the image of God. So um, you can eat animal food, but the idea, you're right, the Talmud is not suggesting thou shalt not eat food of animals. Um, although, although at the time of the sin of Adam, it was considered part of the punishment of humanity that we were lowered to eat animal food. But animals sometimes eat meat also. Correct. We are not discussing, this is not a nutrition class. We're, not, we're, talking, we're talking in the terms of theology. We're talking the idea that there's human that were created in the image of God, and then there's the animal kingdom. So that you do not have a problem with. The animals are in a lower status than human beings. Okay, okay we're, we're, we're not going to get upset that we killed Harambe, the gorilla. Oh, I, that was that killed me. When Bambi's mother died, I cried. I'm, I will admit this publicly. That was one of the traumatic moments of my youth. Was the death of Bambi's mother. But that's not and others as well. Okay, you can see over here. I'm just making a point. And just in general, we're seeing over here the idea of being. I think we should drop this point. This is so not central to what I'm saying over here. That just what just in general, the idea of humanity having a higher purpose, and this comes with us its own. Um, sense of taste, sense of smell, sense of music, and sense of being that comes with it. So now, um, let's go back to the Bracha Hatova Metiv. Something happened 2,000 years ago, and that thing that happened 2,000 year, years ago prompted the rabbis to give us a Bracha. This is where I was going, where I was going over here, that assumed that every day a person breaks bread. Actually, they, this is, you know, people do this twice a day. People used to have uh, two meals and a snack two meals and a snack, similar to the way a person prays, two meals and a snack, the snack being the evening prayer, which is a voluntary prayer. But the idea is the parallelism between food and prayer is very, very much specific, as the Kuzari brings down, because a human being is a body and a soul, and, and our, our, our prayers and our Torah study connects our soul to our body, and our food connects our body to our souls. They are yin and yang. They feed off each other. So now, going back over here to this blessing over here. This blessing comes with a story. Once upon a time, says Maimonides, let me read you the whole story. Hayat Sarah Gadola Kamochurban Besa Migdash. So the Rambam does not mince his words. He said, however bad the destruction of the temple was, the destruction of the Beita was equally destructive. Was equally destructive. When was the destruction of Beita? So there's different versions. The common version, it was 52 years after the Chorm. Just a little bit of, of history over here. Um, Hadrian, when he first became emperor, where are the Brits over here? Any British people? No, anyone British? I mean, in England, you always think about Hadrian because of Hadrian's Wall that was there to keep out the Scots. The bottom line is Hadrian began as a very beloved and seemingly humanistic um, type of emperor. But that changed very, very quickly. Because what happened was is that Every single nation that the Romans conquered tended, in the end, to just say, you know what? We're going to just become Roman. So I don't know. So in Espana or uh, whatever, or Provence or Dacia, which is Romania, when these countries were conquered by the Romans, and the Romans said, here's the deal. We will build you schools. We will build you roads, amphitheaters. 
stadiums, whatever you want. We will bring Roman civilization into your country. All we're asking you to do is pay homage to Rome. So more or less, the nations agree. But the Jewish people never began to accept this. They were always a thorn in the side of the Roman Empire. And Hadrian, when he saw what was going on, that the Jews kept on revolting, eventually he decided enough is enough. We are going to deal with this Roman style. And what he unleashed, says Maimonides, was a bloodbath of extraordinary proportions. So let me read it to you, a little bit of the information. I'm reading you from Dio Cassius, who was a Roman historian in his book, History of Rome. Now he says that they killed, Hadrian killed in this, in this killing orgy, half a million Jews with the destruction of Beta and a thousand settlements. Now I have no idea if you have to take this literally or not. Um, a barrel, Rabbi Beryl Wine states that there were 100 million people in the whole Roman Empire. That means if you kill half a million, you are killing, um, help me, you are killing half a percent. But it's, it doesn't sound so good when I say that. But it's, it's 100 million people, that means every one in every 200 people were murdered over here. So it's a crazy statistic over here. The Talmud says it this way. The Talmud says in Nezikin, this is uh, in Tractate Gitin, in the fifth parak, 57.1, 80,000 uh, Karni Muhammad, which means the leaders of the battalions that used to blow their special trumpets, they entered into the city of Rome, and the bloodbath was so big that the, literally the, a river of blood went into the Mediterranean. By the way, you see clearly that today's modern Beta, where my daughter lives, is not the same as the ancient Beta. Beta was clearly near the coast over here. And then Rabbi Eleazar HaGadol says that they measured this river, the river that had two parts water and one part blood. And then, crazy, crazy statement from the Talmud, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, they, um, they would fertilize their, their, their vineyards and their fields around Betar for seven years. So it's a little crazy statistic, but not completely crazy, because um, I just want to share with you, when I was in Poland, the first time I was in Poland, this goes back 20 years, we went to a place called Sobibor. Anyone been to Sobibor and visited it? So Sobibor today, I understand, they made it already touristy. But when we went there, there was nothing there. It was a football field, a soccer field. And there were like Polish kids playing there. And we were told, oh, yeah, this is where the camp was. A little plaque that set it over. And then this lady, Janina, who lived in one Sobibor station, she comes out flapping her arms and says, and says let me show you the ash pools. And she showed us the ash pools. And she basically gave us a guided tour of the area. And she was incredibly, incredibly sweet and nice. This old lady, I asked the Yanina, why are you doing this for us? What do you care about what happened over here? And she said, she said, she said you know, I'm, I may be Polish and I may be a Gentile, but uh, the Nazis killed most of my family. So I feel this is my duty. At that point then, I felt a special connection to this old lady. And then I asked her the following question. I said, Yanina, you know, it's now, whatever, 50 years later. Today, the biggest thing is called Holocaust denial. And where you go, people don't believe in the Holocaust. It's become like, you know, uh, um, I think today, the majority of this planet believes that six million people is a huge exaggeration. That's the world that we live in today. It's a crazy world. The bottom line is, I asked Yanina, I said, where we are now, so it's Sabibor. Sabibor had, I don't remember the numbers, let's say it was 150,000 murdered. What do the people that live around here, what are they thinking? And she answered something that was so shocking. She said to me, she said to me, what are you talking about? She says, everyone here knows about what happened here. He said, within a mile radius of where we are now, the farmers are still tilling their fields with the ashes of Jews. That's what she said. This is 50 years later. So I thought a little bit about what happened over here with the bloodbath in Beitar. So if I would stop the class now, and if you would leave, you would say to me, OK, so Beta was a place where lots and lots and lots and lots of Jews were killed. Then you would have missed the point of my class. Because the whole point of my class is the next 15 minutes. Everything's going to fall. So everything is really leading up to what I'm about to say now. Beta was not just a pogrom. It wasn't just a massacre. 
something else happened. And Maimonides continues and says the following words, quoting the Jerusalem Talmud. There were tens of thousands of Jews. They had a powerful king. All the great leaders of that generation, which of course included Rabbi Akiva, the great Rabbi Akiva, this is the Melech HaMashiach. They were sure that Bar Kokhba was the Melech HaMashiach. Bar Kokhba and all these people, they were murdered in huge numbers. There he is. It was a terrible event like the destruction of the temple. So my rabbi, Rabbi Shapir, explained, if you read the Ramam carefully, he's telling us why exactly was it equal to the destruction of the temple. Because something else happened in Beitar. Beitar was not just the destruction of people. It was the destruction of what's called Malchus. Malchus means that the Jewish people once had a king, once had a nation. The king was basically the centerpiece, the heartbeat of the Jewish people. That was destroyed. Malchus was destroyed. The Jewish people have a, a, a building called the Jewish Temple, but we also have another blessing for King David and his dynasty. That's what we lost in Beitar. We lost our nationhood with a king. That's what happened over here. Now, I'm looking at the clock. Bar Kokhba, you should know, according to Maimonides, did not start off as a bad person. Rabbi Kiva was not fooled by Bar Kokhba. He started off good. The stories that we have, if you go to the Bar Kokhba caves, you can read the letters about how he cared so much about making sure that his fighters would always have have a, have a, you know, a little of an asterisk for sukkahs. They all had tefillin. He always made sure that for every soldier he had, he had more people who were studying Torah. This you see is the ancient custom that Jewish soldiers twin with, with spiritual soldiers. So we have over here, so to speak, the external army. It's Sahal, the Israeli army. You have the internal army, which is the yeshivas. This is something that goes back really to the time of Joshua. It was always, always like that. Now comes my point. Everything went wrong and everything went bad. But then the Romans did not stop there. The Romans were sadistic and the Romans knew what the Nazis would later perfect, that if you want to destroy a people, you've got to destroy their spirit. And this is the point of the class. This is where it all happens. Hadrian said, how do I make sure that the Jews never revolt again? That Rome should live a thousand years and the Jewish people should disappear and assimilate into our empire. We're going to terrorize them. We're going to make sure that we squash this one and for all. Listen carefully what they did. Quote, at that time then, Kerem Godol Hoyla Andrianus Arasha, the evil Hadrian, built a vineyard, Yudches at Yudches Mill, Kamo Tibera Litsipuri, the distance of approximately Tiberius to Tzvat today is more or less. This is what he did. The, he had half a million dead people to play with over here. He built a huge vineyard, a huge wall, 18 by 18 kilometers. Again, I don't know if you have to take this literally, but it was massive. It was massive. He stacked them up upwards. So freshly murdered Jews were stacked up like this in the boiling Galilean sun. We're not talking about, it was not the north, it wasn't in Poland. This was in northern Israel. He stacked them up. And if you think of it, anyone passing by would see the scene and see what the Romans do if you revolt against them and they would not be happy. You want to destroy our spirit? This is the way you do it. People would see family members, friends. They would look at these things and they would be terrified to the depths of their hearts. Comes along. <sighs> comes along Hashem and says, I would like to have the last laugh. Is that OK? I want the Jews to have the last laugh. The two miracles happen. The first miracle we say in benching every day, Hatoiv, God was good to us. The bodies did not decay. Year after year, so Jews and Romans would go past, and they just looked like they had been freshly murdered that day. They still had that, that, uh, that aliveness to them, even though that they were dead. This was a creepy miracle. 
but it terrorized not the Jews, it terrorized the Romans. Because the Romans say, this is a miracle. The God of the Jews is somehow taking care of them in a way that we cannot understand. It's against the laws of nature. Bodies are supposed to decay and rot. But there's something vibrant against them. There's something vibrant about these bodies. Hatov, God is good to us. And then Hamativ means, finally, they were allowed to be buried. Mativ means he makes sure that goodness continues into the future. What is the depth of this awesome miracle that the bodies did not decay, and this awesome miracle that the bodies were allowed to be buried? Well, so what's the big deal? In the end, bodies were allowed to be buried, so what? Why do we have to celebrate this every single day? And the answer is as follows. In the next two minutes is really my class. And everything I'm going to do afterwards is just explain how benching is so relevant to our lives. It's 2,000 years since this story happened. And during those 2,000 years, the Jewish people have gone through a lot. We talk about hunger. We talk about what we've gone through. But just the tip of the iceberg, the Jews have suffered a lot. We've really, really suffered. Today is not the time to talk about why. I'm just talking about that we suffered. We have every reason to want to give up. We have every reason just to want to assimilate into Mary and to disappear into the local population. We did not. 2,000 years later, we are as vibrant and cutting edge as ever. We are at the forefront of every single humanistic idea. We are still doing more charity and more goodness than, than, than many nations put together. And we're still here to the annoyance of the rest of the planet, symbolizing God's plan, symbolizing a world where heaven and earth can actually meet, symbolizing a world where physicality and spirituality are in harmony. I tell you, God is good to us. God is good to us means that we defy the laws of nature now, here in this world. No one can understand how we're still here. Go and ask any intelligent non-Jew who admires us, and there's a lot of them. They will all talk about the mystery of the Jews. What is their secret of success? How come we're still here, still vibrant, still cutting edge? Why are we, I don't know the statistic off by heart, why are we 0.001% of the population and something like 10% of the Nobel Prize winners? And something like 70 or 80% of all the big charities in America are somehow connected to something Jewish. What's going on over here? What is our secret? That's Hatov, the secret of Jewish survival in the diaspora. And then comes Hamativ. When you plant a seed in the ground, you know it's not dead. And when a Jew plants their parents and grandparents and loved ones into the ground, they know that in the deeper sense they're not dead. Jews do not believe in death. Jews are eternal. It's just a temporary situation that we believe in, that whoever died, whether it be in the structure of the temple all the way to the Holocaust, all the way to the Jews who are dying here today in this country, all of them is just a temporary separation of body and soul. They will come back and live forever and ever and ever and flourish and become greater and more beautiful and more powerful. This is the centerpiece of Jewish belief. The fourth blessing of benching is relevant to us because what we're going through now, we remind ourselves, Hatayv v'hametiv. God is good and he continues to be good. And then we finish those words out of all the goodness in the world, Hashem gives us everything we need. Once again, a reference to Mick Jagger. Everything you need, you have. Okay, so those of you who say, what about the exceptions? That's not today's discussion. I'm talking about those of you in this room. You look at your lives. No one has a perfect life. We know that but there's so much that is perfect in your life. You have friends, and you have family, and you have, you have even sometimes the food here is good. And everything, you, you know, it's amazing what goes on here. There's so many beautiful sunsets and so many beautiful things to enjoy and to laugh at. Hashem takes care of us. You open your eyes, you see so much goodness and love from Hashem here in this world. That's the fourth bracha over here. Ladies, I want to say something incredibly important. I have in front of me another page, which I'm not going to go through, that talks about the importance of benching. Um, I had teachers, one of my teachers, Rabbi Usher Zayda Grubenstein, of blessed memory. When I close my eyes, I think of him. I think of him benching. I had teachers that I watched them benching with joy. And what they taught me is something huge and something very vital. We serve Hashem 
through the power of our blessings and our benching, and we serve Hashem through the power of prayer. What's the difference between prayer that you daven in the morning, you daven in the afternoon, and benching and your blessings? So let me read to you that the Arizal brings down, I'm quoting to you from his student, Reb Chaim of Olajan. He brings down, and I quote, he says, my master the Arizal told me, you want to get Ruach HaKadosh, you should do it by having the proper intent when you say benching, when you say blessings, especially benching, which is from the Torah. And then I have over here quotes from the Hasidic masters, all talking about that benching has a deeper power than prayer itself, not just because prayer is rabbinical and benching is from the Torah. He says, what happens in the higher world causes a connection based on Ava, the Achva, love and brotherhood, the Kol Ha'ilamais, Marikim Shefa, Obracha La'ilim Atachtain. It unleashes all kinds of goodness into the lower worlds. The difference between benching and davening is that davening, you take your three steps with a pain in your heart. And benching, you say benching with a belly full of good food. One is done because you recognize that you cannot survive without Hashem. That's davening, the recognition of man's insecurities. Benching is taking that moment when it says, Va'achalta, v'savata, you have eaten and you have become satisfied. And you feel like God himself. You feel so powerful. You tell a great meal. meal. Life is so good. And then you say, you know what I could do now? I have a choice. I can become narcissistic and, and, and believe in myself and the power of humanity and ignore God, or I can take my whole experience and give it over to Hashem in thanksgiving. That's benching. Benching is capturing the moment when man sees everything that's beautiful in their lives and you give it over to Hashem. That's that benching moment. And this brings me to the three weeks because I want to give you all a message. Everything I'm going to say to you is true except for Tisha B'Av. At Tisha B'Av, you don't bench. At Tisha B'Av, you lie on the floor and you cry and you just mourn. But we are going through now a process that we have to remember and remind ourselves and constantly reinforce this huge big idea that there's two ways to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu. You can serve him through tears or you can serve him through joy. And that's your choice. And the idea of benching means that you can see the problems and the tsaris and the challenges through a different set of lenses. When you're benching, that's the moment where you have the chance to see the cup that's half full. That's the power of that moment. And here, I give you your challenge over here. At least the next time you bench, try and remember this class and put a big smile on your face over here and realize that benching is a gift. It's a reminder that we have this ability to see everything in our lives two ways. We can see it through pain or we can see it through joy. Choose joy. Choose joy. Choose like all those great survivors of the Holocaust that had this ability that in the most difficult moments to see something positive. And this was their secret of survival. To us, on the most simpler level, it's the same thing in our own lives. We can focus on all the terrible things and everyone has that little packet of things they can complain on. Or you can look at that, that beautiful fruit and you can say to this, this probably tastes delicious. But look how Hashem gave everything to us with so much love and so much beauty. That's how Kodesh Baruch Hu loves, runs his life. Hatoiv, he's good to us right now. The hamativ and the questions that I have that I don't have answers are, I believe with a complete belief that in the end I'll see that that was good as well. Everything will reveal, reveal to have been good. So I want to give you all, I'm not going to be in next week or the week after. So I want to wish you all, enjoy your summer, but during the three weeks that we're about to enter, so you look through the lenses of man's challenges, through the, through the lenses of joy and the lenses of goodness, and this deep belief that everything that is negative out there, if you just go a little bit deeper, is a loving God who's not ready to reveal his love yet, but it is there, and this is the centerpiece of our belief in our beautiful future. Thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.